You guys knew this was coming, and today, it's here. I pulled the trigger and got myself a Leica 35mm steel rim reissue. How does it look? How does it feel? How is its build quality? What happened to Leica's quality control? And most importantly, what do the pictures look like? Today, we're going to take a look at everything about this lens. What it does well, what it doesn't do so well, the pictures that it makes, and at the end, we're going to take on the question of how does it compare with my all-time favorite lens, my vintage pre-aspherical Sumilux. I'm excited. Let's jump right in. Unless otherwise indicated, all the pictures that you're about to see were made with the 35mm steel rim reissue developed at home on a rotary processor. So I did a ton of gear shuffling and I finally got my hands on a copy of this. And man, I'm excited. You see, the Prius Frico Sumilux is my favorite lens. It's the lens that I use for everything. A lens that I love so much that it stirred me to put together my very first video here on YouTube where I go over everything about this lens. And that's a funny thing, right? I didn't really start this channel to be on YouTube, but to chat with you about a lens that I love. Now, when I put that video out, like I had just announced the reissue of the steel rim. And so I was like, man, I already have a really beautiful lens. Why bother with a new one, right? Right. So here we are today and here the reissue is because sometimes some questions just need answering. The reason why even considering this lens is such a big step for me is because I'm not the kind of person who really goes out and changes lens every few hours or every few days. For my personal work, I choose one lens to be my main lens and that lens is glued to my camera for five to seven years at a time. Now I might dip into other perspectives here and there, maybe one or two days out of a month, I might go somewhere specific with a a certain intent in mind and shoot a 50mm lens for the day. But for the most part, I'm a one lens kind of guy and doing that allows me to take my mind off gear and focus more on picture making. So because of that, once I've decided on which is going to be my main lens, it takes quite a lot for me to switch that out. And add to that that my relationship with the pre spherical Sumilux, I've shot hundreds and hundreds of rolls through it so it's developed to a certain point and it's not like I'm at a low, right? where things are boring. In fact, it's pretty much the opposite. Despite being very far removed from that honeymoon stage of buying this lens, the pictures that come out of this lens to this day, it still excites me, which is a really precious thing. But so then, if I already had a lens that I loved, why bother with the reissue, right? Well, two things. There are two things about the vintage lens that still could be a little bit better for me. First off is the ergonomics. I go over this in great detail in my earlier video, but because the hood rotates freely on the front, as you're out shooting, sometimes the tab on the hood lines up with a tab on the aperture ring, making it a huge pain to change those aperture settings. And that's a thing that you would think would go away with time, right? You use the lens a lot, you just learn it and adapt to it over time, it becomes second nature, and you would assume that it will go away, but sadly, no. To this day, and I've used this lens every single day for a few years now, it's still a problem and it still happens. Now it has gotten better over time. Say when I first got this lens, it would happen, let's say three times per day. But now it happens once a day, maybe once every two days, but it still happens and it still gets in the way. Number two is its tones. With the softness and the delicacy of the vintage lens, which looks beautiful to me on black and white film, especially high contrast black and white film. When it comes to color negative film, it doesn't really do enough for me. Generally with color film, I'm not really into that faded look. I want more contrast, more pop, and slightly more saturation. And I've personally never really enjoyed the vintage pre aspherical Sumilux on color film. So I've tended to a more modern lens, like say the spherical Sumicron. And so with those two things, the reissue seems to solve that problem, right? It seems to. It has filter threads and the hoods don't work in the same way. It wouldn't just spin freely on the front. And being a lens that is really prone to flare, those hoods make a huge difference, especially wide open. And with the new coatings of a modern production lens, it promises contrast and saturation. Are those things really true? Well, that's what we're going to find out today. After a bunch of gear shuffling and passing on two copies that had defects, 
More on that in a little bit. I managed to acquire this, the modern reproduction of the very first pre-aspherical Sumilux that preceded the one that I currently use. The original steel rim Sumilux was produced between 1960 and 1966. Then from 1967 to 1995, the externals of the lens were changed to the version that you're seeing here. This is my main lens. It's commonly referred to as the version 2, but it's really not technically a V2 because all the pre-aspherical Sumilaxes actually use the exact same optical design, meaning the formula of the optics, the number of lens elements, the shape of those lens elements, how they're arranged. Everything should be the same. They should be identical. But that's where things get interesting. You see, many people are divided on this. Say between 1960 to 1967 with the original steel rim. Some people say that the ones with goggles rendered differently from the ones without. And even between the black-bodied pre-aspherical sumiluxes. People say that different years of this exact model is different where it was made. Mine is a Canadian one. People say that the ones made in Germany look different or the ones made in this certain decade is different. And the funny thing about this is I actually spoke to someone who worked at a camera store for many years and he mentioned that at one point in his store there were many different copies of these vintage pre-aspherical sumiluxes and he could try them all and he said they're all slightly different so that's one group of people. Then on the other side of things, you could imagine people would say that, oh, they're just all the same. There's no difference at all. We're not going to go into the nitty gritty details of how and why those vintage pieces differ. Some people say it's the coatings, the ingredients and the materials that go into the glass. All that aside, just know that all pre-aspherical sumiluxes, the original steel rim, my version 2, even this reissue, they're all technically supposed to be the same lens based on the same optical design. But there are some differences between them, especially when it comes to the physical design. So let's take a look at that. First off is the weight. The reissue comes in brass and so it's slightly heavier than the version 2, which is made of aluminium. To me, the difference in weight is not too significant, but I'm generally someone who is very comfortable with heavier lenses. So in my hands, they just both feel really small and light. Both focusing rings are really smooth for the most part. But here's where you'll find one major difference. The reissue has an infinity lock, which automatically engages when you focus the lens to infinity. So you can't turn the focusing ring anymore until you press a small button on the tab. Is this a big deal? Well, for me, it could be. Because over the years, I've gotten really comfortable with focusing from infinity to my desired target. And practicing that technique has allowed me to get really, really quick with manual focusing. But you won't be able to do that with with an infinity lock. Not a huge deal, but that's something you want to take note of if you use a similar focusing technique as I do. Now one pretty significant difference that I did notice on the focusing ring of the reissue is that somewhere between the 5 to 10 meter mark, there's almost like an increased sense of tension. Like something was resisting me. It doesn't quite feel smooth and there's almost like a rough scratchy patch there. I'm not sure what's going on. Maybe it's the infinity lock being engaged too early and rubbing up against something on the inside, but that's the first strange thing to me. The focusing ring isn't very smooth once it hits 5 to 10 meters. Maybe something is not quite right with my specific copy, but more on that later. The V2 on the other hand has a beautifully smooth focus throw throughout its focusing range. So in terms of how the focusing rings feel, the vintage piece comes out on top. And speaking about rings, the aperture ring. This one is a slight bummer. Some people have already noted this online, but the aperture ring on my copy is slightly loose. You can see some play as it wobbles side to side, and other people have experienced this as well. To me, not a huge deal, but definitely not a good thing. But that said, there is an upside to the aperture ring. It's slightly larger, and ergonomically, it makes a big difference. With the new aperture ring, it's much easier to change those apertures, especially compared to my vintage Piece. So thank you Leica, one huge point to the reissue. Another change to this lens is that Leica added filter threads. The old one doesn't have any, so if you wanted to use filters, you need to unscrew the hood, pop it in and then screw it back. And with the reissue, you have 46mm filter threads, which sounds amazing, right? 
But that's where things start to get a little bit confusing. You see, the reissue comes with two hoods, an Olax hood which mounts to the lens by clipping into the indents on the chrome section of the front. And with the other hood, it's a round one and it screws into the lens via filter threads. The perplexing thing is that despite adding filter threads to the reissue, because of the way that the hoods work, you actually can't use hoods if you're using filters, which really confuses me. So here's what I mean. Say you put on a 46mm filter. You can't use the Olux hood because there's just no indents on the side to clip on, so it just doesn't fit. So you try to use the screw-mounted hood to the top of the filter, but doing that actually creates a vignette in the picture because the hood now extends too far front because it's sitting on a filter. So very, very strange. Despite adding filter threads, you can't actually use a filter with the included hoods. And of all the lenses that I could think of in this world, this is a lens that needs hoods the most. So that's quite a big design oversight in my opinion. And speaking about hoods, before landing on this exact copy, I actually tried three different steel rim reissues in person here in Singapore. The first one had a tremendously wobbly aperture ring, much worse than what you're seeing in this video, so I passed on that. The next one had a hood that was super loose, it didn't work at all. It didn't even clip into place. If you just touched it, it would fall off. And I'm not sure how that passed quality control. It just looked like a tremendous defect to me. And finally, the third copy, which is mine. This one has a slightly wobbly aperture ring, but thankfully the hood isn't too loose. I still ended up getting it because I figured that a tighter hood is much better than one that doesn't stay on. And before the warranty is up, I do intend to send this in to Germany to get that aperture ring fixed. So if you want to see updates on that to see how Leica handles this, stay tuned and subscribe. But so that's been my experience acquiring this copy of this lens. Not super great. Now before you call me a Leica hater that is complaining about the small things, this lens retails at almost 4,000 US dollars. Now unless you're rolling in cash, it's not an inexpensive lens, right? And because so many other Leica lenses, they all feel so great. So when Leica puts out a lens that you're paying top dollar for, that feels slightly subpar, I'm not surprised that many people online are complaining about this. For me personally, I'm going to give Leica the benefit of doubt here because maybe all these problems are teething issues with the first few production copies. And hopefully as they make more and more of this, those later versions will solve these issues. So in any case, I still ended up getting it because to me, I'm not too fast about those things. Disappointing, yes, but to me not really a huge deal breaker because what I personally care about, my highest priority is the pictures that it makes. So how has that been? Well, so far I've put about 15 rolls through this. So this is very much my preliminary thoughts, but I've actually been really enjoying it. It definitely has that same DNA as my vintage piece. It's cut from the same cloth, but it feels tightened up slightly, like those rusty spots have been polished away. Pictures made with this lens look more held together, slightly more refined, and you definitely see less of that charm where a picture falls apart, less of a sense of fragility. In terms of tones, the blacks definitely do go deeper. Throughout the aperture range, I'm consistently seeing an increased sense of overall contrast, especially in those shadow regions. And the biggest difference that I've noticed so far is the performance of this lens wide open. With the vintage piece, the moment you go wide open, it's like you're turning the flavor dial up to 12 out of 10. There is just so much character, which I love because I only use it quite sparingly when it adds to what I'm trying to say with a picture. But with this new lens, at f1.4, I'm seeing significantly less glow, less breakdown in the picture as compared to what I'm used to. So if the character dial on the vintage one goes up to 12 upon 10, this one goes up to 7, maybe 8. Definitely less of that overt flavor, which may or may not be a good thing for you depending on what you're looking for. So overall, so far, this lens seems to really keep the spirit of that pre-aspherical Sumilux alive. The background blur has that classic signature and it renders things with that same sense of three-dimensionality. It presents space and shape in a beautiful, charming, vintage lens kind of way. So I'd describe it as a tighter, more tuned-up version of my pre-aspherical Sumilux. So far, 
really nice. But now you might be wondering, how do these two lenses directly stack up against each other? Now I'm actually in the midst of putting together a more in-depth side-by-side review between these two lenses, one where we can really take the time to focus specifically on an A-B comparison between pictures made on each lens. We'll be doing comparisons in bright light, low light, indoors, outdoors, black and white, color, wide open and stopped down. But before we get to that video, I wanted to first reach out to you to get your thoughts. Let me know in the comment section what you'd like to see in that video. Is there something in particular that you'd like me to cover that I haven't mentioned yet? Are there any specific questions that you have about these two lenses? Anything at all? Let me know in the comment section below and I'll see what I can do to include them in. Subscribe to stay tuned for that video. That's all I have for you today. I hope you had fun and I'll see you in the next video.